Thank you, Jesus. No better place I'd rather be on a Friday night than right here. You may be seated. Thank you to Bishop and Sister Woodward and the Lehmans for having us. I've always wanted to come to this part of Canada. It's a little far up here, um, but it feels good. And what lovely people you are. We are missionaries to the Philippines. My husband was raised there. He first went there when he was two years old. I went in 1996, but I actually became a better missionary than him because he knew all of the dangerous things and all the foods, not what to not eat. And I didn't really care. I wanted to have fun and learn the culture. And I had a blast and I'm bigger than any of them. So I felt safe. I instantly fell in love with the Filipino people. And although I love North America, my heart is with my Filipino family today. Um, I first went there in 1996 and I can take you to the place in Manila where the Lord laid something on my heart. At that time, our children were, our boys were seven and our little girl was six. And there were children begging at our window, the ages of our children. These children were dirty and hungry and obviously nobody was taking care of them. And I felt at that time, the Lord said, do something about it. A lot of people go to countries like this and are changed for a minute. And I have been guilty of that in the past. But I felt at that time, the Lord said, build an orphanage. Well, that was in 1996. And I didn't do it for a very, very long time. Life happened in different situations. And it wasn't until our cancer journey that we had to walk through a couple years ago that something got in my spirit and I got a fight and I remember what God told me to do in 1996 and my husband looked at me one day and he said if I don't have to die in this hospital and the doctors are wrong and we get to go back to the Philippines and do what we're called to do we're not going to allow fear to stop us from doing something God has called us to do well he was very weak at that time and I don't really know if he knew what he was saying then but it got in my spirit and so when the doctors I'm not spoiling anything he's here tonight God healed him so thank God for that but when the doctors finally said we can't keep you here any longer go do what you've been called to do we finally went to the Philippines and I remember sitting with some friends that day in 2018 and I looked at them and I said I'm going to build an orphanage here in the Philippines next year and it kind of shocked him because we hadn't really talked about it and it is kind of a big deal to do and so they said, we're going to pick you up tomorrow, and we're going to drive you one and a half hours south of Manila, and we're going to show you something. And so they did. They drove us to this beautiful province outside of Manila, and I'll never forget driving up on this property. They said, in 1996, the Lord told us to buy this property and that a ministry was supposed to come to us, and we're to give this property to this ministry. And they said, nobody ever came. I said, well, that was me, sorry. But all of, they built a prayer and fasting house on that property. And so for all of those years, that property has been solely used for our leaders and pastors and church members to just go and pray and fast and be alone and quiet with God outside of the big cities. And what better place to build an orphanage than saturated soil of God's people with prayers and tears and so they gave our foundation Hope Village International that property and then we started and then COVID hit COVID didn't take God by surprise it did us but even through COVID we were able to build some um, projects that we wanted to build there and our contractor died and so we've had a lot of setbacks but I'm here to tell you tonight, I'm going to show you a video. At the end of the video is an update on what God has done. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about the video that I'm going to show you. In this video I'm about to play for you, there's a little boy named Alvin. He lives in a place that factors into the story of the great Philippine revival many years ago. It's called Smoky Mountain. 53 years ago, the first converts in the church in Manila came from this exact spot called Smoky Mountain. After two years of fruitless labor, the first breakthrough came from this place. As unlikely as it seems, the fourth largest slum in the world gives birth to one of the greatest revival this world has ever seen. It's called Smoky Mountain. 
It's where outcasts, misfits, and lost causes became the greatest evangelists this world has ever seen. So enjoy the video. Thank you for having us. God bless you. The Philippines is beautiful and gracious. There is more to the story. We didn't go there for the beauty. We went there for the millions left behind. The Philippines is a nation of 110 million people spread across 7,000 islands. Metro Manila has over 20 million people. We could say a lot about the city we love, but for the purposes of this video, there are approximately 3.5 million homeless, of which 1.5 million are children. While this is heartbreaking, the more than 300,000 orphans or abandoned children is beyond unthinkable. Meet Alvin. There were many children begging that day, but he stood out to us because of his shirt. Our cameras followed him home and found this story. His father died several years ago, and he rarely sees his mother. He lives on the remains of the old Manila landfill known as Smoky Mountain. He spends his time begging and digging through the trash, living mostly on his own. These are the invisible ones. They live in the shadows, trying to survive in a world of predators, alone, hoping someone will find them. The realities of their lives are so horrific that we rarely tell the whole story. Because our sheltered minds shut down and reject what we've heard, it's too terrible to be true. The more we are involved with these people going into these very dark places, the more we are impressed by the power of hope. They were born with nothing. They have nothing. They only know this. Yet, somehow they still hope for something they've never seen. It's as though God planted a seed of hope deep down in their hearts, and if you water that hope and give it a chance, they flourish. When all the trash has been picked through and the children strip down and jump into the sewage, they fill with their hands and feet for plastic bottles and cups to sell. After working all day in the sewage, they come out with a few pennies. They should be going to school, beginning a life with hope for tomorrow. But instead, it's another trip up Smoky Mountain. Could it be that Alvin finds the courage to keep on climbing this seemingly hopeless mountain every single day because somewhere in his little heart, he believes that help is on the way? Nothing in his world gives him the assurance of this. However, even in his condition, he believes he's worth saving. For years, we've organized meals and snacks, but dropping off some food every now and then isn't what they need. They need someone to care for them. They need positive role models. They need mentors. They need love. What they need, they need a miracle. The miracle for some of them is called Hope Village, one and a half hours south of Manila in the beautiful countryside. We are opening in an orphanage, and at first, 
we will be able to house 24 girls ages 3 to 12. Our goal is to get these girls adopted as soon as possible. We're focusing on girls first because it's just worse for girls. I'm sure you believe with us these little girls deserve a good and safe home. So, Smoky Mountain, if this testimony were a heavyweight fight, the Philippine revival was knocked down in all 15 rounds and the referee was counting over them seven, eight, nine, and just before 10, just before counted up, out, the church got up. And in the limited amount of time we're going to have here, I'm going to tell you a very incomplete story or version of the, the revival that just would not die and has swept the entire world. In 1969, my mom and dad moved from Vancouver, British Columbia, and they uh, went to the Philippines. And at the time, they say that in the entire world, there probably was no more than 1,000 people of Philippine descent who were full of the Holy Ghost anywhere, including the Philippines itself. And so in 1969, most people believed the Philippines was least likely to respond to the apostolic message because they were very um, devout Roman Catholics and their entire life and culture was built around their religion and its symbols and rituals and whatnot. And so mom and dad were a young couple that were tasked with the big job of starting the first Bible school in the country of the Philippines. And, and, and one year later, they were then tasked with starting the first church in the mega city of Manila. At that time, it was a city of over 8 million people. When they went there, it was said that there were no born-again believers in that entire city. Of course, we don't know for sure, but they didn't know of any. And when they went there, they were unsuccessful in preaching the gospel to anyone or converting them for the first two years. Their approach was to go to the doctors and the lawyers and, and the business people, and nobody responded. Nobody wanted this, this message. They were very entrenched in their traditional religion. And so literally, um, before dad was ready to give up, 
He said, I know where we're going. We're going to go to Smoky Mountain. Smoky Mountain was probably the most infamous uh, place in Southeast Asia at the time. It was literally the end of existence. It was where you're not quite dead, but you're almost dead. And, and, and there's, when there's nowhere else, literally nowhere else to turn, people ended up at Smoky Mountain. It was... It was like nowhere else on planet Earth. It was like a doomsday castle of filth. It was a twisted and warped nightmare of those living among the death of the decay because it was the, it was the landfill of eight million people in the city of Metro Manila. And in that place, the people lived literally on the trash and that mountain of trash that was always smoking. And crime was the social construct and desperation was the culture. It was a place where literally anything goes and no one was ever held accountable unless there were vigilantes inside that community that took care of it. The police didn't dare to come to bring law and order. They, they, they didn't dare and they didn't care either. The politicians ignored this. In fact, the video we were gonna show you starts out with all these beautiful pictures of the Philippines because it really is a beautiful country, but we've gotten criticism from people because they've said, why are you showing these, these pictures and this video? Because it makes, it makes it look bad. But the reason we do is because it's there, it's real. It's where, it's where tens of thousands of people live. And so it, it's a place of concentration of viruses and bacteria and diseases and hope hopelessness and, and, and the dead when they died they, they laid where they died and they were just covered up by the next layer of trash and, and, and there was no funeral it was the cemetery of the poor if you've ever seen a family crawl out of a hole in that mountain of trash it is an image you can never scrub from your, your mind and, and they they find almost anything organic out of the trash and they throw it into a boiling pot, whether it's decaying or rotten or what not. And, and after it boils for a while, they feed it to their family. And so that is Smoky Mountain. Smoky Mountain was to be a place that the gospel was on display because if God could save them and turn their life around, God could change anybody's life. And so we came from Canada, beautiful British Columbia, and we went to that city. And, and Dad said that when I was um, two years old, that for, for my first year, my favorite saying was, I smell something. <laughs> Everywhere we went, it didn't smell like Vancouver. It didn't smell like the beautiful Northwest. And I would, I would just turn up my nose and I'd say, Dad, I smell something. And Dad said, before we give up, we're going to Smoky Mountain. And so they brought their sheaves for Christ Volkswagen van up into that, literally drove into the mountain of trash. And they opened up the doors and they said to the children who congregated there, they said, if you'll come to church, we'll feed you. And of course, they filled up that van and they would go day after day and they would find the same children if they could. And as time went on, the children began to evangelize their, their parents and they started to come. The parents started to come. Well, after a period of time, uh, the, the partner pastor, the, the Filipino pastor, Pastor Ompad, he said to my young father, he said, when are we going to teach these people about giving and about tithing? And my dad showed his ignorance because he said, these people are too poor to give. And we don't need their money anyway. You know, we've got a budget, and our budget pays the bills. And Brother Ompad looked at him and said, well, Brother Mallory, then how are they going to be blessed? And it hit Dad. Maybe I should be doing what the Bible tells me to do and teach the principles of the kingdom. And so they started teaching tithing and giving to the poorest of the poor. These are people that never saw money. They lived in a trade and, trade and barter world. And, and, and the preacher was preaching because they needed to be pulled out of that life. And it started catching on. 
One day the ladies came to my mother and they said, Sister Mallory, we, we want to give. We've been hearing all these messages and we want to do what the Bible tells us to do, but we, we don't have money. What should we do? And my mom said, I'll, I'll, I'll go to prayer about it. And so a little while later, she came back to them and she said, all of you eat rice. She said, when you cook for your family, just reach into that rice sack and get a little handful of rice and put it aside. And at the end of the week, you bring your handful of rice offering and you, you put it on the altar and that will be your tithes and that will be your offering. And it began, a handful of rice. And I remember my childhood days growing up, it would be little plastic bags all across the front of that church where people would bring their handfuls of rice. And st today, over 50 years later, they still do that. All through the Philippines, they bring their handful of rice and now that money is going to build churches. But God began to bless them. Because the principles of the kingdom work. And pretty soon they'd be showing up and they, they would be so happy because they would, they would show off their shoes. And Filipinos, they love shoes. And they would say, look, I got these shoes at a store. I was able to buy these shoes. I didn't have to get them out of the trash. And, and they would say, the reason is, is because we have gotten a job. And now I really have money in my hands. And, and they would be excited. They'd come with a new, this is a barong. This is what the Filipinos wear to church. And they'd come with a new dress shirt, a barong. And they'd say, I bought this at the the store and, and and they began to be lifted brother I think you said it today redemptive lift they were lifted out of the pit from which they had been dug and God began to bless them and now three generations later they are the doctors and the lawyers they are the business people, hallelujah. We see them all over the world. When I tell this story, there'll always be somebody from the Philippines come up to me and say, my mama raised me in Smoky Mountain, but I'm not in Smoky Mountain anymore because God saved us and God put us on a higher place. But pretty soon revival started coming because those, they, those soul winners, they didn't care what you thought. They were going to tell you about Jesus. And the first service came where a hundred people were filled with the Holy Ghost in a single service. Now you got to think about this. There were not a single convert for two years. In 1968, the year before mom and dad went, there wasn't a single person baptized in Jesus' name. And now they have a service where 100 are filled with the Holy Ghost. They said it can't get any better than this but those people kept winning souls and then there was a service where 300 were filled with the Holy Ghost in a single service hallelujah and then they rented a big auditorium one day and sister Bobby Shoemake was on the piano just like that playing uh, just instrumental there was nobody exhorting there was nobody giving direction and the spirit of God fell on that congregation and before it was over 500 people were talking in tongues for the very first time Hallelujah, but it kept getting better. Praise God. They didn't stop. They kept winning souls. And then there was a service where a thousand people were filled with the Holy Ghost. Can you imagine in one service, what would you do if in this place, hallelujah, 1,000 people were filled with the Holy Ghost for the first time in a single service? And then the day came that hadn't happened since the day of Pentecost. 3,000 souls were added to the church in one service in one day because they all, hallelujah, everybody began to speak with other tongues that was in that auditorium and 3,000 people were filled with the Holy Ghost in one service and then 5,000 and then 10,000. Hallelujah. And then... Dad was in Louisiana driving down the highway and God said, will you believe me for a million soul revival? And, and, and dad said, yes, Lord, I believe. And he started preaching it everywhere and, and, and it just took off. Things really took off and entire families were converted. Entire villages were being swept up by the Holy Ghost. It was a tsunami that was sweeping across that country. And by 19, 1985, the United Pentecostal Church was the fastest growing religion in the entire country. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They said, these Filipinos don't want this. You go look now and see if they want it or not. Praise God. Wherever you go and they're Filipinos, there's revival. 
But the saints from Smoky Mountain, the second generation, the third generation, and those that they began to win began to sweep across the entire world. And now if you go into Europe, there are churches that are populated and started by Filipino saints and whatnot. And it's all over. Singapore, Hong Kong, Paris, London, Amman, Jordan, Saudi Arabia. Brother, Brother Woodward's been to many of those locations. Hallelujah. You know what? God doesn't need to start with princes. God will make his own princes. He reaches into the pit and lifts you out. But then challenges come. The enemy don't want us to have revival. And so challenges came and circumstances beyond our control led our family after my senior year in high school to being suddenly removed from the Philippines. It was against our will and it led to about 10 years of, of I guess you could call it exile from, from the Philippines. It wasn't all bad. Brenda and I got married and we had three children. But the Philippines was the love that we could just never let go of. And when, when the 10 years was passed, things changed and we were allowed to return and it was just an incredible celebration and revival fires burned again. And, and when that happened, my wife and I together, we just looked at each other and said, this is what we're meant to do. We're going to go back and we're going to be missionaries in the Philippines. And so it was the happiest day of our life when we sold everything that we had. Amen. We just got rid of it and we moved our little family to Manila. And it was the first minister's conference that I attended. It was actually just their, their monthly uh, get-together in the city of Manila. All the pastors would get together for prayer. And, and I showed up, and all of them wanted to know one thing. They said, what about that million-soul revival? What about the million soul. Did your dad forget about it? Was that just a dream that he had for a little time and, and it's passed? Or, or is that still a thing? And I reached out to my dad. I said, Dad, what about the million soul revival? They're all wanting to know. And it started things to begin to happen. I think there were even people from this church and from New Brunswick that went over there in year 2000. It was 32 simultaneous crusades that went all across that country. They called it the dream team. And in that one week, I think it was over 100,000 people were filled with the Holy Ghost in a single day. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you for that rousing response. <laughs> Hallelujah. A hundred thousand in a day. <clears throat> but again, challenges came. And it was like that, that heavyweight fighter get punched and you go down to the mat and it's like you're down there and you hear the count and you're like, should we get up or, or should we just lay here? Is it over? But you got a little bit more fight in you. And so we had to leave again. And it was, it was kind of a, a big deal. And, and, and uh, it, was, it was just, it was, it was painful. It was a painful process to go through. But sometimes the will of God kind of works out that way. Sometimes Joseph doesn't actually get to see his brothers kneel before him before he has to go through the pit and betrayal and prison and, and whatnot. You gotta have you gotta have an anointing that can endure hardship. Fourteen years of suspended missions activity went by and we made trips and my wife and I we uh, would go about three times a year leading teams and preaching and humanitarian efforts. And I never, we never got far from Smoky Mountain. We would go into that place. But it was a time of bittersweet frustration. We, um, we knew we were called. We knew what we were called to, but we couldn't get there. And so we started two churches in Hawaii. We pioneered a work in Maui and a work on the big island of, of Hawaii. And we tried to keep a good spirit, but our hearts were just longing to go back. And then one year we were at Because of the Times, and I was probably like about another thousand people in that auditorium. I was laid out across the front. And I was pouring my heart out to God, and I was crying. And my pastor, Pastor Anthony, looked down at me and was moved with compassion. And, and he famously says, I don't have words for people. But he said, I know where to get a word for somebody. And so he went to go find a prophet of God. And he said, you see that pitiful soul? I don't think he said it that way, but that's what it was. Do you see him over there? He needs a word from God. And that, that man looked at me, and he said... I don't have a word for God from him, for him. 
I'm glad I didn't know it then because that probably would have pushed me over the edge. But the next day, he came to us, and he, he found my father. He was in the same conference at the same time, and, and he got us together. And the Spirit of the Lord moved upon him, and the prophetic began to come out of him. And he began to prophesy, and he looked at me, and he said, The mantle is upon you. The mantle of your father is upon you. The mantle of anointing is upon you. The mantle of harvest, the mantle of revival. And he just went on and on. And he said, The red light has been changed to a green light. The closed door has become an open door. You're about to return. And it happened just like he said. Praise God. He said that you are going to put together seven teams that go to seven regions of that country. And when you do, revival fires are going to just break out all over that country. And so the many, many years of struggle and setbacks and, and, and discouragements all seemed to finally be at an end. And it was the, the suffering... It builds character, I was told. And I, 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 I told my dad, I said, I think I got enough character. I'm tired uh, of this character business. I just need to get over there. And so it was kind of like, let the million soul revival be fulfilled. And so we went back to Smoky Mountain. We had seven teams. In fact, we put them together in that very same conference at Because of the Times. And, and, and it, was, it was incredible. And, and uh, revival did start. And, and it, was, it was a powerful experience. But while I was there, I got sick. And it was a deep cough that would turn into bronchitis, and, and no matter what we did, it wouldn't go away. And so we finally had to come back to the States, and, and the doctors did what they could. And, and it was just one of those lingering coughs that, that just kept going and going. And finally, they got it where they said, okay, you're good, and I would go back, and um, it would happen again. Another, another exact same thing, and it was a sign that something was really wrong in, in my body. And one night we went to sleep, and everything seemed to be normal, and woke up the next morning, and my wife looked at me with alarm, and she pointed right here at my neck, and she said, Jeff, what is that? And I felt of it, and it was like a, a large goose egg. And we went to the doctor, and the doctor said, well, good news, it's not cancer. Everybody knows cancer don't grow overnight, but he was wrong. It was a rare form of lymphoma, and he said it's thought to be incurable. But the worst part about it was the name. He said the name of this disease is mantle cell lymphoma. He said that it is already stage four. It is throughout your body. They did a bone marrow biopsy. My bone marrow was 70% cancer. They said when the scan was, was done, it revealed that the tumors were all throughout my body. They were in my intestines. They were, that my spleen was twice its size with, with cancer. There were tumors in, in my colon, and, and, and what, it was just tumors everywhere they looked. And so at the time, we were pastoring a church in Maui, Hawaii, and the doctor there said, get off this island as fast as you can and go find somebody that knows something about this disease. And so we were in between assistance, and we had to leave that great church. It's a, it's a revival church in Maui, and we had to leave it behind and didn't know what was going to happen with that church. Thank God Pastor Anthony began to send preachers over to that place, but we escaped there to go find a doctor that knew something about this rare and fatal disease. And we ended up in the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. It's where the National Cancer Institute is, is located. And, 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 and the doctor there that's the head of the lymphoma team is Dr. Wyndham Wilson, who is the number one lymphoma doctor on, in, on the earth. And out of the 68 known lymphomas, this one doctor has discovered, named, and come up with the protocol of 63 of the known lymphomas that are in the world today. And when we met that team, that doctor said, if you sign on the dotted line, you're going to enter into our study, and we are going to study you, and we're going to use you for science. He said, we will spare no expense, and we will give you everything that we have, all the new treatments and the things that we hope are going to one day be able to cure this disease. But we need you to know that after this is done, that you will benefit science more than we benefit you. 
because we have not been able to cure mantle cell lymphoma. And so with that, we go into the study and, and we're 5,000 miles away from home. We're even farther away from our calling and we're in the hospital and they hit me with, with harsh chemotherapy drugs, seven of them at the same time. And I instantly got sick, just as they said I would. And I lost 70 pounds and my immune system tanked and my intestinal tract just went crazy and, and, and everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And finally, after the third cycle of chemotherapy, my colon ruptured and they had to perform an emergency surgery and they don't want to do that when you're low on blood, low on platelets and your immune system is tanked. But they had to give six, it was 62 staples. I came out of that 12 hour surgery later with an ostomy bag. And there I was in ICU and I'm asking God the question, which mantle? Which mantle is the real mantle? Because they can't both be my destiny. Because they are opposite from one another. And so one of these is the real one. And as I sit right now, this one seems to be the real mantle. And... I was dying. I knew it. The doctors said I was dying. My body confirmed it. My wife had to say goodbye to me on two different occasions. She, she literally gave me the speech. You've been a great husband. I'm going to miss you. All of the things that, that a wife should never have to say to her husband, especially twice. And, and I listened to all of that. I got to hear the tender last words releasing me from my pain and suffering and even myself, I had told God, I am good to go right now. I'm, I'm right with you. And, and, and I, I don't think I just want to keep living my life this way. At one stretch, I was in that hospital for nine months. I went home three nights in nine months. And then it was to be a two-year hospital stay. Which mantle is the real mantle? But I didn't die, I just kept living. I don't know what was keeping me going other than maybe God had a plan for my life. Because I ain't no better than anybody else. I, I'm, not, I'm not this special person that God would heal me and not them. That's not that. It, it's just God is sovereign and God had a plan. And my parents and our children, they would visit. They couldn't bear to watch. They had to leave. But thank God, my wife never left me. She stayed with me the whole time, sleeping on a chair or something like this for a couple years. Amen. Husbands, be good to your wives. You don't know when you're going to need them like that. Amen. But I'd say, God, if this mantle is from you, I need to know because this ain't working for me and I, I can't go there I can't tell you all the little revelations that God gave me through through this time but what I did find out later was that if God is for you who can be against you and so I wasn't this huge tower of faith I wasn't the person that the whole time I was just telling everybody, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to be healed. It's going to be fine. I didn't do that. I, I just was kind of an ordinary person making my way through this, just fighting the good fight of faith and sometimes really letting it go sometimes. I'm just being honest. I began to change and I needed to change. Something in me was dying and it needed to die. Because God had been trying to use me for years and the reason I wouldn't get there or do that or obey him was because of fear. And every time God would open a door, fear would stop me. And I began to realize that laying in that hospital and I told God, I said, God, if I don't have to die in this hospital, I'm going to live my life different when I get out of here. And I had a meeting with Brenda. I said, you and I, we got to meet she said, well, why don't we just meet? We're always together. I said, no, I need it to be a meeting where we remember what we say. 
And we stood there that day, and I was so weak, and, and I didn't know what to say, but here's what came out. I said, what if the doctors are wrong? What if the best is yet to come? What if I really do have an anointing? What if the mantle is upon me? What if we're going to go to the Philippines and, and all the dreams that we've seen? What if they really are going to come to pass? And I said, Brenda, between you and me and God, if God lets me live, I'm not going to let fear stop me from walking through a door that God opens in my life. From then on, I'm just going to live radical. And I want you to know, hallelujah, that God healed me. The doctors gave up on me, and I've got to hurry because I'm going somewhere, but the doctors gave up on me. They brought us in on Valentine's Day, and they said, it is over. It's time to go home and die. There's a tumor on your liver at the bile duct, and it's growing fast. If it grows any, any more, it's going to shut off the function of your liver, and it's three to five days. That's all you can be guaranteed that you have right now is three to five days. Go home, make it right with your family. Tell people that they've done you wrong. You forgive them. Do whatever you got to do because it's over for you. And I want you to know, hallelujah, that it ain't ever over if God is in it. And the story of how he healed me is a dramatic thing and I don't have time to go into it, but he healed me in a church in a church altar. And it was an atheist doctor that had to present me with the news. The cancer is gone. Science has no explanation for it. We don't understand where it went. We don't know why you're cancer free, but go change your world. While I was in the hospital, there was a place, and I remember I was in a situation much like that where Brenda handed me the phone, and I had a text message from the Philippines, and it was yet another from the same place. It was a place called Demolok, and Demolok was calling, saying, you've got to come, and I'm like, I can't come. If I could, I would. Well, I prayed about it. I said, we'll come. But I found out later the reason we'd never been there is because their industry in that place is kidnapping for ransom. That's their business. If a foreigner wanders into their, their world, they kidnap you. And if you don't have $6 million, they video you on YouTube with your head rolling. But I said, I'll go if God will let me out of here. And the Lord called my bluff. You're healed, now go. When the doctors finally released me, Brenda and I, we bought a ticket for the island of Mindanao and the, the city of Davao. It's a safe city. When we landed there, the pastors were shocked that we had taken them up on it. <clears throat> we said, yeah, we're coming. We're here. They said, well, tomorrow we're going to get an SUV. It's going to take eight hours to, to drive to the, to the Molok from, from Davao. The first two hours, you can sit in the, the seats like ordinary passengers, but the last six hours, we go off-road, and you have to lay down on the floorboards, and we cover you up because you can't be seen on the way. I see you didn't tell me that part. But before we could go, the Lord provided another plan. Another guy came to us and said, you won't survive the drive. I'm going to donate you a chopper. I said, I like that plan. Instead of eight hours, it's going to be 30 minutes. Okay, I've never been in a chopper. I'm ready. He said, before you go, though, you're going to cool your jets for about two days because we're going to mobilize the 73rd Battalion of Army Rangers, and they're going to go into the Molok and set up a 10-kilometer perimeter so when this bird lands, it won't get shot out of the air. I said, wow, that's cool. I didn't know you could mobilize the military. And so two days later, we got in that bird, and the next picture shows that we're flying over. And I saw, yeah, there are no roads. I mean, it's, it's very mountainous. Look at the next picture. The way you get there is you just travel through the river bottoms and, and the, next, the next picture. That's the road. It's a river. The next picture. And then we arrived. And the military was there and they opened the doors and they said, you are safe. Come on and your people are here. Hallelujah. And the next picture shows that uh, we, we got to meet some of our, our brothers and sisters. The next picture is the pastors that came in out of the surrounding mountain area. And 
we had a wonderful time. We were having a talk. I mean, that's basically what we were doing, was just fellowshipping. And after a while, I said, what are we doing here? There's no sound system. There's, there's no plan for a crusade or a seminar. I mean, what, what is the purpose? And they said, the reason you're here is because we have a story to tell. I said, that better be some kind of story. <clears throat> they said, it is. They said, 45 years ago, there was not a single apostolic anywhere in these mountains. But a missionary came walking through here with his guide, an interpreter. And they were going from village to village, walking by foot. And they stopped here in Demolok. And they were in this place for one night and one day. And they preached and a bunch of us were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to teach us all night about this mighty God in Christ. And, and they were showing us in the word, the Bible. And we'd never seen a Bible for ourselves. And, and they left some material with us. And then when the morning came, they, they left. And, and since they left, not another missionary has ever been back to see what we have done with the gospel in 45 years. And I said, well, now I'm interested. What have you done with the gospel? <clears throat> and they took me to a place that I could see all the way around. And, and, and it's, it's a low area surrounded by beautiful mountains. And they began to tell me that on that mountain over there is how many churches. And, and on that mountain, how many churches. And if you follow that valley and you go up there, there's villages. And there's 50-some churches in that river valley. And they just were describing all of the churches that were around us. And I said, wow, I was getting goosebumps. I was saying that is an incredible story. They said, yes, we have been so successful evangelizing this mountain region that the names of these mountains have changed. The government itself calls these mountains the Pentecostal mountains. <clears throat> they said because 98% of the population of this entire mountain region is baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah, evidenced by speaking in tongues, living a holy life. They said, in fact, you can travel all through these mountains and the only churches you will find are our United Pentecostal churches. There's only one church of any other faith, religion, or denomination anywhere in these mountains and we're working on them. I said, I'm gonna tell that story everywhere I go. <clears throat> but by the time... We were about to leave. I, I, I thought of a question. I said, I've got one more question for you before we leave. I said, who was the missionary that day? And they said, well, it was your father. <clears throat> that was him on that trip walking through the, the cobra infested razor blade grass dodging the militants and whatnot he got shot at he got sick he he sacrificed for that and here I am in a chopper <clears throat> flying back and I'm telling I'm talking to fear at that point I'm saying fear I'm so glad that I didn't let you stop me from walking through this door hallelujah because on the other side of the door it wasn't danger it was this experience that you had been preparing for 45 years since that time, we have been able to meet the president, not just a few times, but quite a few times. And now the president likes my cooking and calls us. He just called us in April. You need you to cook for us. We have 200 dignitaries coming. And so his people reached out to us and said, we want your crazy American food. And I'm sitting there with the president one day and he's telling me all the stories of his life and, and how he's going to turn the country around. And while he's sitting there talking to me, I'm just saying, yeah, hallelujah. They told me it was over. They wrote me off, but it is incredible what all has happened in my life since they wrote me off. The best really has come. The anointing really is here. And I want you to know that in that country today, they say there are over one million apostolics who have been filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And they're all over the world. And then we start the orphanage. And it has been one 
miracle after another. We're going back October 12. We're going to finish that thing. Our contractor died of COVID in the middle of construction, and we had to put a pause on the two-story big building that you saw there, but we got 30 people working there right now. And we're going to put the doors in. We've got to put the windows in. It's going to take us about $9,000 to get the plaster and the paint on the outside of that building. But we're going to finish. Hallelujah. And there are going to be 24 little girls. They're going to have a home. And we're going to take them out of Smoky Mountain. We're going to take them out of those other places. And we're going to put them in a home. And it's going to be an adoption center. It's incredible what has happened. If there's anyone here that you feel you're just looking at the end of the road, I want you to know that the best is yet to come. <clears throat> that the enemy doesn't write your story. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. <clears throat> Amen. Let's all stand. I gave you the abbreviated version. But I want you to know that right now, if a door opens, we're walking through it. Because I've seen what death looks like. I, I've come to that place where, where it really was. I was convinced it was over. But the Lord said, here, I'm just going to give you this whole new life. That's the kind of God we serve. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. What if it ain't over? What if the best is yet to come? What if you're about to get another level of anointing in your life? Hallelujah. What if God's about to open that door that's going to lead you into a new dimension in your ministry? Hallelujah. 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 Is there anyone here you need a miracle? Jesus is here. Jesus is here. Hallelujah. Is there anyone that you want to represent that needs a miracle and you want to come down here right now? Hallelujah. It was in an altar just like this that the doctor said it was over and we went to church. Hallelujah. Nobody laid their hands on me. There was, there, was no, there was no ceremony to it. It was just the presence of God. And I felt it hit me at the top of my head and it began to burn all the way down through me. And I knew Jesus has just touched me. Every tumor in my body was gone. My bone marrow went from 70% cancer to not a single cancer cell. That's the kind of God we serve. Hallelujah. Lord, in the name of Jesus, God, I speak healing in this place. I speak deliverance. God, you're the chain breaker. Hallelujah. Lord, we pray that you would move in and that you would shake up the demonic world that is working against these people. We pray that you would bring them out, set them free, tear down the strongholds, bind the strong man in Jesus' name. Deliver. I pray against the spirit of cancer. I pray against the spirit of diabetes and liver damage and bone pain Lord in the name of Jesus I speak against pain right now in Jesus name that's it hallelujah 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 